Hello, everyone. My name is Jacob Fortung. I'm the host of this podcast, Do Us Within Emerging Markets. And I, I just want to share my experience with uh, using Anchor so far. So I, when the pandemic started, I, I thought about starting a podcast. And the whole idea was to bring in some really amazing folks that are doing some great work in their respective industries within the emerging markets. And the Anchor platform really helped me get the word out there and also just make it a lot easier for me to invite the guest and, and just share the amazing um, experiences they've had and the amazing work they're doing in their respective industries within the emerging markets. So um, it's pretty fun. Um, you don't even worry about the technical part of uh, making the podcast. You actually just focus more on the content and Anchor has done it really well for me. So I will highly encourage anybody who is trying to start a podcast to uh, try to use uh, uh, just check out Anchor, and I think you won't regret it. I'm not a technical person, uh, but you know, if you listen to these episodes that I've been been publishing so far, you know, it's, it seems like you know I, I know what, uh, the technical part of it. But you know, Anchor helps you take care of the the technical part, and you just focus on the content. So uh, feel free to check it out. I highly encourage you won't uh, you won't uh, regret it. And you know, it's it's right there. You don't pay anything. So. Um, you know, in, in times like this, I think starting a podcast and getting the word out there, irrespective of what you're doing, will be a really great experience. So thank you guys for listening to my episodes. Please check out uh, Anchor and you you will have a great time. So uh, cheers, guys, and see you guys next next episode. Thanks. So hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Jacob. I'm the host of this podcast, Doors Within Emerging Markets, and I'm honored to be here with Chia Cho. Yes. I hope I pronounced that right. Cho. Um, yeah, no, that, that's great, actually. Yeah, that's Cho. good. I'm excited. That's good. I got this right. Um, right. She's the chair, uh, she's the chairman of Technico based in mm-hmm. um, Vietnam. Uh, yep. Is it in Hanoi, Hanoi or is it in Tangai? Yes, we're right. We're based in Hanoi. Yes. Okay. Okay. That's great. That's great. Um, so um, I, you know, it was just um, an mm-hmm. interesting way I met her. You know, I was attending a, um, a live session of pitches done by this uh, fascinating um, uh, organization in South, from South Korea, based in South Korea. And she presented there and, you know, her, her story was great. So. And I think she has a lot to share on this podcast. And I'm, I'm really excited to hear her story and learn some very cool things from her. So uh, thank you so right. much for being here. No, thank you. It's, it's an honor for me. Um, I've never been on a podcast before. So really looking forward to this experience, actually. Yes. So yes, um, my name is Chia. Um, I'm based in Hanoi. Um, I'm the founder and CEO of TechVico, and we're basically a center fusion machine learning embedded systems development startup. So uh, we focus on a lot of deep tech technology, so specifically SLAM, which is a technology that provides inanimate objects and mobile robots spatial awareness and semantics. So we've been working on this for two years now, and um, we're coming up with our first product, which we'll be launching next year. So that's really exciting. Um, so yeah, I'm really looking forward to share about my experience. That's that's amazing. I, you just went right into it. Um, so, just, <laughs> yeah. so let's take a step back. So if you can, um, one of the things I love to hear from um, the guests on this podcast is just to learn about where they're from and you know how they right. grew up and all that. So uh, one thing I love if you can share with us, it's just uh, you know, like, where did you grow up? You know, can you just take mm. us back to where everything started? Uh, I think that'd be great. I, to, to know. Sure. Yeah. So I'm Taiwanese, actually, um, but I was raised in Malaysia, Kuala Lumpur. That's where I grew up. Yeah. So um, I was born in Taipei, and then my parents mm. moved to Malaysia, so that's where I grew up. Okay. Uh, up till high school, then uh, I went to college in the States. Um, I graduated Penn State. Oh, Penn State. So, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so then after that, um, uh, we started the company in uh, Vietnam. Yeah. And 
for the past two years,、uh, mostly I was traveling a lot,、yeah. um, busy with a lot of、uh, work and meetings around. But、um, during COVID,、uh, things slowed down a lot. Obviously, traveling was、um, prohibited. So then, as、uh, more and more projects are ongoing with、uh, my startup here, I had to move to Vietnam. So this year, actually, I relocated and moved to Vietnam. So, Amazing. Yeah, we're going to talk about Tecnico, and we're going to talk about you know how you guys have,、um, how you as a chairman、um, has、right. you know navigated with your project and all that.、Um, that's great. It sounds like you've、mm-hmm. been to many places, so you have an understanding of how cultures play into just how you know how interconnected the world can be, but also how as、right. you know, as as a leader of a company, you can you have to take into consideration different cultures, right?、Um, For sure. So,、um, just going to that, how is it like? You know,、um, now you're a chairman of a company. Can you just take us、mm-hmm. um, on how you got to be a chairman of a company? What was the right? You know, the stages that took you to this position, right? <laughs> Right, right. So,、uh, to be quite frank, like my story is a little bit、um, non-conventional, I guess you could say. <laughs> so, it, it, I would say for me, it's a little bit unique as well. But、um, basically,、um, my my startup is part of a global consortium. So, within this global consortium,、uh, we are a family of、uh, tech companies in different <laughs> verticals, and it's actually、uh, my parent company. It's Uh, it's a family business originated from that, so、um, that's kind of how I、uh, got my way to、uh, running this company right now. <laughs> And yeah, that's so, great. A little bit non-conventional, yeah. That's 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 great.、Um, to go into、mm-hmm. so as you are the chairman of Technico,、um, right?、Uh, just tell us a little bit about it.、Uh, since you've you already give us an idea of what you guys do. Uh, mm-hmm, what what、mm-hmm. does tech do? What does tech vehicle do? And uh, uh, yeah, just give us a kind of a sure, one minute、sure. one minute pitch. <laughs> sure, sure. So we focus on sensor solutions.、Mm-hmm. So we do a lot of sensor fusion projects where we fuse camera sensors with lidar sensors、uh, to provide a more robust solution for various applications.、Uh, we work a lot with artificial intelligence, and one of the technologies, as I've mentioned before, is we focus a lot on SLAM. Which is a technology、uh, that gives mobile ro- robots、uh, spatial awareness.、Mm-hmm. So yeah, that's what we're working on at the that's, moment. That's that's fascinating. I myself, I have literally little or no background, but、right. you, you make it sound you make it sound very interesting.、Um, mm-hmm. So、um, thanks. Once you got into technical. Can you tell us like what has really made you passionate about AI? I know we talked offline,、mm-hmm. and you said. Uh, one of the things about your company is that you are really、uh, you love what you're doing. You said you mentioned spirit, right. right? What really made you excited? Because I think it's very geeky to be、yeah. fascinated with AI、sure. and machine learning. So I know there are a lot of you know female listeners out there,、mm-hmm. young women out there that、um, they don't see technology or AI as a space that they need to get involved in. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, what can you tell them to, or what can you share based on your passion,、uh, something、right. that、um, they can get involved in? I see. So I think、uh, with technology, developing these really new, advanced、uh, technology, it's really something that is.、Um, Human nature, in which we're always chasing、uh, for to to better our lives, is just not being satisfied with the status quo. I mean, if you think about it, just back in the days, you know, when we when man created fire, it's because we're not we, we want to change, right? We were we want to challenge the status quo, and we want to move forward and advance as human beings. And I think a lot of people would argue and debate that we don't really need. Artificial intelligence, so、yeah. to speak, and it's true we don't need it per、mm-hmm. se. But I think it's just the human nature of you know always staying curious, always wanting to know what could be you know evolved,、yeah. uh, what could change, you know, not being com, you know, not being comfortable.、Mm-hmm. So yeah, I would say that's what really drove my passion、yeah. in artificial intelligence. 
And I think knowing that one day when um, robots become like another, uh, <laughs> like a gadget, like a, like an iPhone, you know, yes. I, I would feel proud of myself for contributing towards that, you know, no matter how big or small. So I would say that would be what really drives my passion you know, in my field. No, definitely. And I think I, I did read an article that was written about you. And I think what was mentioned in the article and you kind of, it was very interesting for me was, um, you, you said something like, you know, AI, especially in South Asia, is becoming, it's, it's one of those things that um, will have a huge impact in this, in this century. I think you said decade. Right. And you give some good stats, and I'm not actually to give stats here, but you, you mentioned something right. like, you know, this is going to be a very big market, um, um, right. and there's, there's a huge resource in there. Can you just share a little bit more about how you see the AI machine learning space mm -hmm. in Vietnam as well as in as in Asia, mm -hmm. and how you think that will uh, play a huge impact in the way you know the right. industries work and the way you know, maybe our daily life is going to be changed by that. Right, right. Well, I think it, the change is already happening. It, mm -hmm. It's happening progressively, so it's not very um, in your face. It's almost like a, it's like a, it's like something that's going on in the background and then all of a sudden you have this completely new technology, but people are not aware of the uh, progressive changes that are being made in our daily lives. Um, you know, starting from little things like uh, Facebook ads or Instagram ads, like these things, it's like capturing your behavior, pre uh, predicting that, you know, that's AI. It can happen in many forms or, you know, it could be big and noticeable or just very slight changes in our lives. So, I think that is already happening. And I think uh, specifically in Southeast Asia, uh, people usually have the misconception that in emerging countries, um, these uh, in these geolocations, people are unable to catch up as quickly, but I believe that's not true. Mm -hmm. um, of course, we're all doing our part uh, the, the way we can. And obviously I think with the market needs as well in Southeast Asia, it's also quite unique and different compared to other geolocations in the world. So, and I think uh, specifically in Southeast Asia, because of its proximity to China, which is one of the biggest birthplaces of AI technology, you know, so that affects it uh, a lot. And I think you can, uh, you will be able to notice it more and more as time passes. Even in Vietnam, I can notice that already. I see a uh, difference, you know. Mm -hmm. So that that would be what I would say would be the unique um, areas of AI in this region. Yeah, I completely agree with you. I do think, you know, so I'm very passionate about emerging markets. And that's one of the reasons why I started this podcast. Right. Uh, to highlight stories like yours, because, you know, um, I think most of the emerging technologies and application mm -hmm. of them are actually going to happen in most of these emerging markets. Um, and I know emerging market sounds very, you know, there are different definitions of that. Uh, or growth economies as a new phrase that has been coined recently uh, by a good friend. Right. Of, but I concur with you and I'm happy that you're here to make this case, mm -hmm. right? That people should pay attention to Vietnam, to your company, you know, right. and yeah. uh, potentially that can lead to um, people taking things like this seriously, taking these areas seriously. And mm -hmm. without a doubt, I think you guys are on the right track to transform. Um, Thank you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And hopefully you guys come to Africa, right. which which is something I'm advocating for. I, I would love to. I would love to. <laughs> and so, I mean, I would also love to know a little bit more about uh, the, the scene in Africa, like what it's like, uh, the AI scene and tech, you know. I think that's also very interesting. Yes, we'll get we'll get you there definitely. We will, yeah. Um, so now going now, no. Last year was a tough year for every market, even uh, mm -hmm. in a very established economy like the United States. You know, we right. uh, there was a um, there was literally a depression, right? economic depression. Yes. And, yes. Right. So uh, so what happened uh, in Vietnam? I know that's mm -hmm. you know the. <laughs> And how did right. that, and how did you, as the chairman of your company, um, 
you know, navigate the, the right. Yeah, a little bit tough year. Mm-hmm. Well, I think um, last year actually uh, COVID did not hit Vietnam that hard. Yeah. The economy was still doing pretty well. They didn't really have a terrible outbreak, as opposed to this year where I can see. Um, the negative reaction uh, of Vietnam towards this, um, you know, virus, it's, it's a lot more apparent in this year. And I think to help my company navigate through it, it's really to have, to be able to see the bigger picture, the vision eventually, and not just focus on the short term. Um, I think obviously uh, startups especially we have to remain agile with no matter what uh, circumstances we're faced or challenges that arise, it's always important to either pivot or um, uh, just operate in a very agile manner to adapt to these changes. And some of the things that we really did over here was just focusing on the uh, bigger picture as in we might not be able to achieve um, significant results uh, within a short period of time, but we're building upon the foundation uh, for when things get better to have uh, an immediate launch, so to speak. So, yeah, I, I think, yeah. No, go ahead, go ahead. <laughs> no, I, I, I just feel that, uh, yeah, I think for a lot of companies, um, it, some of them might uh, feel the impact a lot stronger, but I think it's still important to not uh, panic about the current situation. I know sometimes it's a little bit hard to predict as well, but just being able to adapt is very important. Definitely, definitely. I mean, that's, that's, a, that's a mindset of a good CEO, um, good chairman. Um, taking the long-term view. So I right. I concur with you. And I think, you know, the way COVID happened, the U.S. was hit the most last year, then it yes. moved to Africa, then now it's now going to South Asia. It's like from right. the west, west to east. It's very interesting. Yeah. Um, hopefully it doesn't come back this way, but uh, hopefully... I hope not. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so, but for all those out there who are still having challenges, you know, we hope that mm-hmm. you, know, you get the help you need and, you know, um, things get... Of course. Better. So just want to make sure. So let's go back. Let's let's mm-hmm. now take like take our audience to something that I feel might be something if you want to share with you or appreciate it as well. Right. As, as okay. Audience. So how is it like running a business in Vietnam? I think some of our listeners, mm, most are in right. the United States. Um, right. Can you share that uh, the ex- like what it what it means to to run a business right. in Vietnam? For sure, for sure. Actually, this is something that I, I love talking about because I I love culture. It's something that is very fascinating to me. Um, it's almost like, a, you know, it, it's just so unique. It's like a human identity, you know what I mean? So mm-hmm. when I first... Yeah, when, when I first moved to Vietnam, I, I didn't expect the um, culture difference to be so strong as in even in a workplace, the way I came around my team or the way I uh, tried to motivate them, it's quite different than what I had imagined. Um, For me, I love uh, ideas. I love encouraging people to share ideas. I I believe there's no right or wrong idea. There's just a matter of um, being courageous and brave enough to voice it out. Um, but in Vietnam, I think because of the cultural difference, the education in which, you know, since they were younger and I'm Asian, so I can relate that uh, you're just kind of you need to be you need to be you need to do as you are told. So we, in Asia, we don't really encourage a lot of individuality, mm-hmm. a lot of ideas and like a lot of teachers would rather just um give you a set of instructions in which they want you to follow it quite strictly and you can't really think outside the box so um being in vietnam in this in the beginning i would always encourage my team to speak up to share ideas and it's i i always face with a, a lot of silence <laughs> that comes with that so um I actually found that they would rather, I, I just gave them a set of strict instructions in which they would follow it, which is interesting to me. And I really had to work around that. 
Um, but at the same time, I wanted to cultivate and nurture uh, my team's, uh, you know, individualities. I believe, you know, they, they might have great ideas that they're afraid to share because of, uh, not to say the suppression, but so to speak, you know, in a way. So that was very unique uh, to me. Yeah, and just little things. For example, like they they have to take naps after lunch every day. <laughs> which is that, like things like this and it, i just funny. find it really fascinating yeah yeah that's interesting so, I, I think you mentioned something about um people voicing their opinions and having this now you have to have the courage but also the culture has to give you the leverage or the platform to right. feel comfortable so that if you challenge let me say the chairman or your manager you don't have repercussions right um right. so how and you have mentioned it's a struggle. And mm -hmm. um, how have you, like, what is the process of like resolving that? You know, making sure that at, on mm -hmm. one hand, you give them that space to share the ideas. And on the other right. hand, you still, because I'm imagining, right, me say when you talk to like older folks, you know, there's still that mm -hmm. level mm -hmm. of respect you need to give and all that. But how has you as a chairman try to find how to resolve those two mm -hmm. Like, I think one is aging culture and the other one is like a new, I want to say Gen Z. Right. I don't want to say Gen Z. It's like more of like, you know, uh, it's kind of a new culture. That's actually, it's, it's not just a thing in Asia, but it's also in Africa to so like young folks are right, bringing right. in this culture and all that. So what has been some of the things you do um, right. that you can inspire them to to feel confident to share, knowing that there'll be no repercussions mm. um, in I the see. workplace? Right. I think for me, um, when you see someone believe strongly in something and passionate about something, mm -hmm. I think that's very influential and that really, uh, you know, seeps through mm -hmm. and it motivates people to change as well. So um, the way I kind of counteract that is be set the example mm -hmm. for change. So what I expect or what I uh, would like to get out of my team, I would be the first one to exemplify that, yep. for example. So I think through little actions like this, they might, it might not, you, you don't see any changes in the beginning, but I, I believe like slowly or gradually, um, that kind of uh, infectious, uh, passionate, passionate behavior really, mm -hmm. really can affect someone. And you, Gradually, like now, I see my team opening up a lot more, mm. um, being a lot more uh, reactive to uh, conversations and, you know, starting uh, debates, you know. Mm. So it's it's good. Like, I think sometimes um, it's easy to get discouraged. Yep. And I have been, I have been <laughs> uh, for, for the last uh, five or six months. Um, but when you see the changes occur, uh, it, it really affects you in a way as well. Like I, yeah. I, I feel very uh, fulfilled when I see mm -hmm. that. Yeah. So yeah. I think it's also the thing where you know the harder you have to work, uh, you know, yeah. earn something, the more you appreciate it. Yes, I yeah. totally I agree, and and that's that's a great answer. I think leading by example um, is very very important, and I have. Um, other guests have shared different versions of what you have said, um, right. which I think that that's definitely the, I don't say the right answer, but I think that's the most, um, you know, applicable and most mm. uh, infectious answer when it comes to how you do with culture. Culture really takes mm -hmm. a long mm -hmm. time to change. So right. great, 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 great feedback and great answer. Uh, so just, <laughs> go, <laughs> just, just going now into the entrepreneurial landscape in Vietnam. Mm -hmm. I'm just curious, how is it like in Vietnam to, like the entrepreneurial scene? Are there mm -hmm. a lot of, uh, you know, uh, you know, foreign experts, if, if I can say mm -hmm. that. Um, mm -hmm. are, are they, on the other hand, because I know your company, your company is kind of, you know, it deals with international right. allies. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So kind of part A of my question, part B is like, how do you think of the local Vietnamese? How are they mm. viewing entrepreneurship? Is there a stigma against I'm an entrepreneur versus I'm a doctor or lawyer? Oh, right. 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 Um, yes. Yeah. So what do you think is the perception of mm -hmm. being an entrepreneur from the local perspective? Mm, and, I see. And the first question was, 
what is the general um, landscape of entrepreneurship in Vietnam? Mm-hmm. Do you think most mm-hmm. experts want to go there to start their own businesses? Uh, do you think there's a huge in, international international right. scene in Vietnam to be part of the entrepreneurial ecosystem in Vietnam? Right. Right. So I think Vietnam is a very uh, unique and interesting place yeah. in the sense where within this country itself, there are two mm-hmm. extremely polarizing perspectives and cultures mm-hmm. as well. Um, I think if you uh, come across a Vietnamese person, they might be able to tell you like in Hanoi and Saigon, the culture is extremely different. Um, I, I, I think this ties back to history where uh, Hanoi used to be uh, the um, opposing kind of, they're, they're, uh, they have a more communal, uh, like they're c- c- communist yes. and it's like a little bit more conservative, a little bit yeah. traditional, and whereas in Saigon they're a little bit more open, li- liberal, things like mm-hmm. that. And even my friends, my Saigon friends and my Hanoi friends, they have quite different personalities and I think that reflects in the startup scene. I think a lot of uh, Vietnamese parents, they, they see startups as uh, something that is unstable, mm-hmm. uh, something that is too risky. And, you know, for uh, in the Asian culture, stability is extremely important. That's why a lot of uh, parents want their kids to be doctors or yeah. lawyers, accountants, have a government job, and that's stable. But what's also great and what I love about Vietnam in the culture is that the people are doers. I think mm-hmm. this also ties back to the history as well, where uh, they really have to struggle and fight. Mm-hmm. So I see a lot of my friends start their own businesses. And I think that is, a, in a way, a form of startup, one way or another, you know? Exactly. Just if you're, whether you're selling clothes on Instagram or if you actually have your tech company. So I see that in uh, various aspects. Mm-hmm. And so to answer your question, I think um, the perception of startups in Vietnam can be Uh, very contrasting depending on who you ask Mm -hmm. so um, but I would say I don't see too many foreign uh, startups here Mm -hmm. because Vietnam it's such a it has such a strong culture and the it's very hard to penetrate the Vietnamese market as a Mm -hmm. foreigner to be Mm -hmm. honest Mm -hmm. Uh, Mm -hmm. unless you have a partner or unless you have someone that really is familiar with the scene Mm -hmm. Uh, they're they're not very uh, they're quite resistant to foreign things, um, not in a bad way. It's just as in they have a very strong culture, and I think you see that as well in uh, like countries like Japan or Korea, in which they love their culture. It's very strong. They're very passionate about you know their language, their unique um, characters. You know exactly. So this is part one of a uh, part of a two series uh, conversation with the chair, through uh, the chairman of Techvico. Um, looking forward to sharing you guys uh, part two coming up soon this week. Uh, thank you so much for listening, and I'll see you in the next uh, part two of this episode. Thank you. <laughs>